This is SciBite, episode 106, for October 22nd, 2013. Hi everyone and welcome to SciBy, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast live on a Tuesday evening and fresh on a Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey Heather, happy science to you. Happy science. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to take a look at a possible new multiple sclerosis treatment, an ancient comet strike, a reality show that might win you a trip to space... An update on the meteorite that hit Russia last year, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. I'd like a trip in space, and I'd like to hear about that meteorite, so I think we better get started by jumping right into the news. Okay, Heather, what is our first story in the news? Scientists have identified a set of compounds that may actually be able to treat multiple sclerosis in a new way. Hmm. So these... Actually, the compounds are actually used in a Parkinson, Parkinson's disease drug, a uh, benztropine, uh, highly effective in that. And it's very, it was showing very effective treatment in uh, mice for multiple sclerosis mm, okay. by itself and in combination with existing therapies. And what it actually does is it boosts the population of progenitor cells that turn into repair, um, things that repair the the part the the fiber the fiber uh, coating myelin that is the problem. So what in uh, we actually looked at a different uh, one a couple of months ago that was treating what happens is in multiple sclerosis the immune system actually starts attacking the coatings of the nerve cell of your nerves, which so it's like the insulating coating. So nerve fibers start. Losing that, they lose their ability to transmit signals efficiently, Mm -hmm. so they start degrading, and it's when your immune system is actually, you know, working against you. So they had once, the last study we talked about, talked about sort of tricking your immune system into realizing that they aren't supposed to attack your body in that way. Mm. But this treatment is actually saying, all right, well, there are cells that can actually go through and... um, maintain and they repair uh, myelin sheaths just as a normal, you know, if something happens to them, they go around and they, all they do is kind of repair work. They're little, you know, mechanics on wheels going around your body. And what happens is what they've seen is in multiple sclerosis in MS um, that the progenitor cells, the ones that make those, like the teachers that teach, will say, you know, the mechanics that the people that teach the mechanics to go out and run around on the roads. Mm-hmm. So they start disappearing. So then all of these uh, progenitor cells, ogliodendrocytes, I actually got it out. So now with less of those progenitor cells, now you have less of the actual cells going out and repairing. So what this drug does is actually being able to boost those, boost those progenitor cells. So it, reactivates all of the uh, all of the going the things that go out and repair that so they're like okay well if it can now you can't use it just that as an aside sci does not <laughs> condone going out and buying off use drugs because it can't self-diagnose this actually has side effects yeah, that are yeah. so it's not proven, you know, quote-unquote effective as a safe drug in MS patients. And it has side effects. But they're looking at it well. The first two, like, most popular immunosuppressant therapies, that's, you know, killing off the immune system pretty much or bumping it way down low to keep keep the body from attacking the myelin. Those, you know, those are, they've got those two. But when you added this new, this new, uh, molecule, the benztropine, it actually meant that they could significantly reduce the immunosuppressive therapy 
even um, adding a little bit of amount of his benztropine, this new dr- uh, drug, meant that they could cut the dosage of the immunosuppressant by 90% and get the same work out of it. So that could really mean you'd have serious you know, reduction in these side effects because obviously if your immune system is doing not much, then you can't fight off you know, if infections or you know, sickness. So they're looking at this and it says, and in fact, what they were seeing is it also goes through and is sort of restoring them as, as, the, as it's going on, you know, as they have this treatment. So it's like it kind of is looking like maybe it's being able to repair the myelin sheaths as fast as MS is destroying them. Wow. So not only would it be, it would be a really good drug in that way if it actually works by saying, could it slow down and or stop, you know, the progression of the disease? Hmm. So it's, it's, it's sort of interesting too, based on, <clears throat> so was it, uh, it was episode 97 that we talked about that myelon, myelon sheeting, that sheathing that's around uh, the, the nerve endings, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's sort of, reversing that damage is sort of the key to it is what it's actually doing or preventing it or is it actually is it actually like is it a full-on prevention so that that damage is never taking place in the first place no it's not a full-on prevention it really is that it's kind of a side swipe i'd almost think where you're going you're saying all right the problem is the Uh immune system is attacking so what they've done before is the immune you know, immune suppressants and the thing we, the study we looked at last time is trying to, you know, fiddle with the immune system itself, saying, hey, distract it, say, hey, this is a friend. What this drug is doing is it's actually going in and finding the cells that naturally um, regenerate and... Oh, I see. Okay. And, you know, to go in and restore, you know, the myelin sheaths. They go in and do r- repairs. And so that drug is actually doing that. It's saying, okay... We're going to boost the population of the cells that go in through and repair that damage. Right, right. So including that with the normal, you know, uh, therapies that do, you know, fiddle with the immune system, in combination, it's making a much more drastic effect. Right, okay. That now it clicks. That's pretty awesome. Hmm. Yeah, so very exciting. I'm kind of interested to see as they move forward into human studies and how fast can they do that because this drug is already FDA approved. That's, you know, one step further. Right. Yep. But, you know, it's changing it using from one disease to another and it's one that has known side effects. So definitely a uh, quite a number of steps between mice and, <laughs> you know, doctor's office help right. or, yeah. <laughs> you know, for people that, that are very interested in this drug. So okay. we'll see how it, uh, how it continues. Very good. We I maybe we'll have a future update on the side bite. All right, Heather. Well, let's take a quick pause right here before we jump into the rest of the show. I have a special pick this week. Are you ready? I'm now, ready. It's probably one of the higher ticket items we've ever talked about on the show. But on Linux Action Show this Sunday, I talked about a Synology disk station. It was a four drive unit. You could put four drives up in there and get up to like 14 terabytes worth of storage. Oh my! Uh, all kinds of nice stuff. And then you t- you plug it into your network, and all your computers can see it. Uh, well, this is sort of its little brother. This is the two bay unit. And what you could do is you'd put this on your home network and you could buy it with some drives or without drives. So you could add your own drives if you want. And you could do something like a mirrored uh, setup in there. So you could grab, for example, grab two four terabyte drives and you could either have eight terabytes of usable space or you could put them in a mirror and have four terabytes of protected storage. So that way, if one drive failed, You'd have that available. And then, since it has an Ethernet jack on there, it also has USB and eSATA, all of the computers in your house could use that as a central storage. And it has so many great features built into it. Like, it can be your central downloader. It can do, uh, it can even do email. It obviously does file sharing. It can do a music share. It can do Plex media server. So, if you have a Roku box, uh, you can put all the videos on the Synology and then it'll share them out over Plex. And then you can watch it on your smartphone, your tablet, your your TV via a web page. Um, Roku, whatever you want. It's really cool. It, there's a ton of aw- awesome uh, features in there. It's all powered by Linux. And it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's $299. But again, 
that is not outrageously more than a really high-end enclosure. And when you figure that this is a high-performance network-attached storage and you can do two drives so they're mirrored, this might be really great if you've got a few computers in your house and you have sort of this sharing files problem where one computer's down and so you want to copy files between and so maybe you've fallen into Dropbox, but that's not really a great solution when, when you want to move like entire game installs and things like that. So this Synology Disk Station 2 Bay Network Attached Storage, the DS213 Plus, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And if you grab that using the link in our show notes, you'll support the Jupyter Broadcasting Network. Now, there's lots of other things you could do. In fact, uh, even if you're not a big Amazon shopper, but you just want to help spread the good word and help Jupiter Broadcasting, just even by sharing links that have our affiliate tag in them, that e those clicks count towards increasing the overall percentage of the affiliate revenue cut that we get. So just generating traffic using our ID is even helpful. Um, and of mm. course, you really help when you purchase something, then a percentage of that purchase is contributed to the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. And that's how we pay the bills to keep the lights on, or in modern day terms, pay the bandwidth bills. And of course... Uh, we have other great affiliates linked at the bottom of our website, as well as our browser extensions. You grab those browser extensions, then you don't even have to worry about it. That's like easy mode to support Jupiter Broadcasting. So uh, you can find the links to the disk station in the show notes, and you can find links to our affiliates at the bottom of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. And Heather, with that filed, well, I believe it's time for the two-byte news. <laughs> no, the news bite. <laughs> yeah. I would scroll down a little far. All right, Heather. So what the do we have? Jump in the band, jump in the gun on you. That's the problem. Well, they, I do pay them by the hour, so oh. I figured, you know, maybe I should just get out. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll get out of them again. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's some of their best work too. It really it is. is. Yeah. All right. So what do we have in the news bite? All right, we have an ancient comet strike. There is evidence that the first ever evidence, solid evidence, that a comet entered its atmosphere and exploded. About 28 million years ago, oh. <laughs> above Egypt. Okay. Yeah, I had you on. I had you on edge. This is like those. Your toothpaste could be killing your family. Right, More yeah. after this commercial. Right. Totally. <laughs> so, you know, in the past, comet fragments we've only found tiny, microscopic sized dust particles in the atmosphere. Some, you know, dust in the Antarctic ice. Very incredibly rare. Hard to get. Now we've actually seen that. Evidence that it exploded, raining down a shock wave of, of fire above the, you know, above Egypt into the desert there. Killed every port of life that was there. Ooh. And it was, you know, heated sand up to about 2,000 degrees C, a little over 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Making glass. So, yes, made a huge <laughs> amount of yellow oh, silica glass. Oh, cool. Now it's scattered all over this you know, giant area in the Sahara Desert. You know, actually one specimen of the glass, one of the most well-known, is was polished by ancient jewelers and is sitting in Tutankhamun's brooch. Oh! It's a yellow-brown scarab in the middle of his brooch. Now that is some rare jewelry. How do yes. you beat that? Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, That's not even from something from this planet. I mean, like, how do you, how do you top that? That's incredible. Yeah. But, so it's, so it also created all these tiny microscopic diamonds. This sort of fell into place. There was um, you know, a number of scientists that really felt like this had happened and they were trying to look for the evidence. And then there was a little black pebble found years ago by an Egyptian geologist that had that silica glass. And they went through and they you know, did chemical analysis on it and finally concluded, hey, this is really you know, hand specimen. We know this is from a comet nucleus. Mm. So they actually gave it the little, the pebble a name, Hypatia. Aww. The first female mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher. That's nice. I like it. I, I'm kind of jealous, to tell you the truth. I, I like, could you imagine, like, if you got that, one of those uh, space diamonds for a wedding ring? Like, you could never, you could, you, somebody could show you their wedding ring, like, oh, yeah, that's a nice ring. I have space diamonds on my ring. You have a space diamond? You could never beat no, it's, that. It's, it's kind of yellow. Yeah, but. Silica glass. Seriously? Space diamond, Heather. Space diamond. <laughs> Wouldn't you want that just a little bit, even if it's kind of ugly? Yeah. Maybe on a necklace. Yeah, I get Anything. You. Yeah, I Up get on you. the wall. Yeah, on the wall would be good, too. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on that one? No, just kind of uh, very interesting. We'll see uh, what other evidence they find or how that goes about. All right, I'm bringing the band back in because right. now it's legitimately time for the two-byte news. <laughs> All 
All right. So what do we got in the two bite news? All right. Years ago, I was interning and really bored in the house that I was renting and had nothing else to do. This sounds like a plot to a movie. I like it already. (laughs) Yes. And there was Survivor. Oh. The first, the first series, you know, reality show. There was. Oh, wow. Yeah. The guy behind that is trying to make another reality show competition. Oh, no. Where the winner will land you a seat on Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 going into space. Okay. Wow. Oh, okay. So this isn't like a one-way trip. No, you you get to come back. This is right up my alley. Now, this is not the first time he's had this kind of a grand idea. Um, Back in 2000, he also had this kind of an idea where, hey, we'll do a reality show... And we'll send the winner to the Mir Space Station. Of course, that didn't go through because the Mir Space Station you know, was electively deorbited by Russia right. in 2001. Right. But now, you know, it's just kind of a rough agreement like, hey, cool, we're thinking about this. Hands wave in air, get everybody excited. Now, the Virgin Galactic itself, the, their first spacecraft flight, they're expecting to be in 2014. And then it'll start opening to the 600 plus people who've already purchased tickets to go. Okay. So then it's kind of a, you know, so this winner might have to wait its turn. So, I and mean, if you're going to have a reality show, and uh-huh. I am not, I think reality shows are horrible. But if yep. you're going to have a reality show, uh, flight in space, pretty good topic for a reality show, I guess. I mean, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, I'm not like totally thrilled about it, but I'm kind of like... Kind of want to watch that because it's probably going to be a pretty interesting reality show. And then, like, yeah, I also like I'd much rather have I'd much rather vote for somebody to win to get in space than who be gets who gets an album. Who cares yeah. about that? So, like the press release was like, "quote groundbreaking elimination competition series where everyday people compete for the ultimate prize." Close quote. Well, so I'm like, what kind of competition would they do? Is it going to be like, like a like a mock NASA like? Uh, boot camp prepare you for space kind of thing and like whoever survives it gets to go that'd be good get to watch them spin around in a circle real fast (laughs) i have problems wrapping my brain around this i saw this and i was like i must share it is kind of sad yeah yeah it it is cool and nifty but really weird and sad yeah it is all those things what what are they gonna do it's like i'm going to backstab this other person and go do this little theory and pretend to do this and that and why do you really want someone that's like being all sneaky, you know, trying to get into space. Oh, and yeah, then that's they true. That's sneaky. true. Reality shows usually end up We're being bringing lying, up the worst of people. Sneaky. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Good point, Heather. Hey, uh, why don't we uh, step away from that gracefully and do some updates? Yes. The Russian meteorite. Last year, we had, you know, February 15th. Well, not last year. Earlier this year. In February, object above the skies of Chobolinsk, right. Russia. This was the one that was caught by all the dash cams, right? Yes, because yeah. there's... 10,000 gas cams in Russia, you know, giant streak across the sky. And you remember at the time they, you know, a lot of the, there was these lot of, you know, shots of, you know, the frozen over lake with this giant hole. hole. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, huh, we're, it wasn't there before. We're pretty sure something, you know, smashed through the ice and into the bottom of the lake. Who knows where it is? I think we covered so, that in Cybite 82, Heather. Yes, there's been a number of ones that we talked about yeah. that. And 83 and 84. <laughs> yes, there was a number. It was like, hey, it just happened. Now they're like talking about where it was. Yeah. Now, yeah. hey, we've actually found a little chunk as, you know, big as the end of my thumb. This is exciting. Yeah, it was just okay. a little thing, though. But now. Yeah. So down from the bottom of this lake, they had a show where this half ton. Well, the, it was a half ton when it came into the sky. And so now they have pulled this piece up. That is at least over 1,257 pounds or 570 kilograms. Now, I say at least because they wrapped this thing up. It was eight, you know, five foot long. So they wrapped it all up and were trying to bring it up out of the bottom of the lake. They put it on the scale and it kind of broke the scale. (laughs) Literally fell. A little, little bit. They did have some cracks in it before. Fell and then it kind of broke into a couple pieces. Oh, shoot. So, but yeah, the fact that it... I'd take one of those pieces and run like crazy. <laughs> yeah, there was 10,000 cameras around, so I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. 
Yeah. They were like eyeballing that thing. I now, did of course, it for Cybite. <laughs> you did it for science. <laughs> Mine. <laughs> then Theater of the Mind showing everybody, see this little piece of rock? It was from space. Yeah. So now, space of course, rocks. it'll go into the local you know, history museum. It'll go on display. Um, they'll wait until they can actually, you know, quote unquote, confirm confirm it. Right. They've pulled up 12 different rocks from the, the lake. Five of them were confirmed to be this meteorite fragments from this. Okay. So it is very large. It is very accepting that it's probably there because it would make a lot of sense. But. Got to you know, just got to uh, make sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Yep. But that meteorite, not this one was not a, was a meteorite, not a comet. You okay. have a cloud because it's burning up through the atmosphere. Yeah. But, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I was looking forward to more updates on that, and we actually did. I was looking forward to seeing if they had found anything in that uh, lake. I'm impressed that they can find a rock at the bottom of a lake. I mean, that sounds like I'm joking, but I've lived on a lake. Like, that's what lakes mostly are, are like trees and rocks, and, and they're, everything's <laughs> dark and muddy. And you would think that thing would be embedded kind of down into the lake bed. So, uh, I mean, I'm kudos sure to they- them. They've spent months, and with lots of scuba divers, this would be kind of, we know there's a chunk of a meteorite down there. We're going to look. Yeah, for sure. We're going to look pretty hard, yeah. and for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> there is a space rock down there. Hey, uh, speaking, of, speaking of things from space, should we do a curiosity update? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. What? Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Yeah! <laughs> All right, so what is our favorite space robot up to? All right, it exam- has examined some Martian atmosphere, and that reading will actually help us confirm whether or not some of the meteorites we hear have on Earth that we thought were from Mars, whether or not they are from Mars for sure. So these key measurements are, you can look at um, inert gas, uh, argon, because it doesn't really interact with anything else. So it's a very, you know, baseline evidence about, hey, let's look about high precision count of this heavier type of argon versus this light type of argon and what the what the ratio is. Now that changes because Mars's atmosphere, um, you know, its atmosphere was lost to space. So you have a very different ratio than we would here on Earth. Because you know, the lighter form of argon much easier to have been taken out through the top of the atmosphere as it, you know, requires much less easy energy to escape. Mm-hmm. So it leaves it Mars with a heavy, with a um, relatively, you know, ratio that is more towards the heavier isotope of argon. So they have these here on Earth. They have meteorites that they have little gas bubbles trapped inside of them. So we say, okay. We think these are from Mars. That means the ratio is, you know, between 3.6 and 4.5. So we have this range of area where we think this is where the ratio should be. Now, we have some measurements from the Viking landers back in the 70s that say, you know, a little bit wider gap. And they say, yeah, we think it's 4 to 7. So we have these number of different measurements that we're kind of giving ranges that we're kind of guessing from. And now the sample analysis of Mars, the SAM instrument, has actually said, all right, Karate chop hand, it is 4.2, which means that we could actually use that measurement to say, all right, look at all the rocks that we get, all the meteorites we have around Earth, anything that we vaguely think might be from Mars, go in, check if it doesn't have a little gas pocket in it, check what the ratio of that, you know, the lighter argon to the heavier argon is, and we can give a more definitive answer as to, yes, we have direct measurements from Earth, you know, uh, direct measurements from Mars, and we can compare them against what we see here on Earth. Now, curiosities, you know, we're talking about as the argon escape Mars's atmosphere. Curiosity is not, you know, built to look at necessarily the atmosphere itself. Now, NASA's next mission um, to Mars, the Mars Atmospheric Volatile Evolution Mission, Whoa. MAVEN. MAVEN. It, what it's designed to do is look at the current rate of Atmospheric escape. So it's looking at how fast Mars's atmosphere is, you know, escaping itself. So you can kind of, you know, back calculate and say, all right, we're going to estimate the history of Mars's atmosphere and kind of get a better idea of 
how fast it is you know, leaving and how fast it may, how thick it may have been in the past. Now, that's actually going to launch uh, fairly soon on November 18th. Oh, okay. So. So something we'll be talking about. Yes. Cool. All right, Heather. Well, um, come on and step into the time machine. And okay. uh, good news, I put the winter tires on her, so uh, oh, we should good. have a nice ride. Here we go. Okay. I got a automatic got, got, box. I got new chairs ordered, and uh, I'm yeah. gonna have yeah. I'm gonna make it's, it's getting nicer, and nicer in here every time. It is really nice seats this year or this time, this time this year, whatever. I can't tell. I'm in a time machine. We land in October 27th, 1780, which is 233 years ago. Heather, what the heck happened this week in science? The first U.S. astronomy expedition was able to view an eclipse. Now, I know. Now, generally, I try to stay away from, um, you know, U.S. specific things because we're not all U.S. citizens. I realize that. Mm. But this one I found really interesting, this story, because, you know, it's 1780 and they're like, oh, these, you know, the group of scientists are on this ship. And we're like, all right, we know the sun is going to be, you know, we're going to be able to see the totality right here. We've calculated it. So they get onto a boat and they get up. The U.S. is at war with Britain. And... The area they want to be in is in the British part oh, of the area. Oh, man. So a British officer actually came and said, all right, we'll permit you to come over. <laughs> you, know, you scientists don't look very threatening. Come on over. Set up your little funny equipment. Science must continue. Science continued. Science crossed the barriers of war. <laughs> and they were ready to go. And then they were sad because there was a slight miscalculation about where they predicted it would be. Oh, bummer. So they didn't see a total eclipse. They saw a thin arc of the sun was still there. So it was mostly an eclipse. It was a partial eclipse. But after going through all that, I'm like, wow, you have braved the waters. You have come up to the edge of a of, you know, war barrier. You have gotten permission to cross into enemy territory. You've set up all your stuff. You're very brave. And then yeah. not quite a complete. But the fact that they were able to go through all of that and get permission. Yeah, that's from, impressive. You know, the essentially the enemy leader, the military, be like, yeah, come on, you crazy scientists. Well, Yay, scientists. That's pretty neat. That is actually pretty neat. And that was 233 years ago. All right, well, I'm going to recalibrate the side by 2000 so that way we can look up into the sky this week. That's right. On Thursday, October the 24th, look about 10, 11 p.m. local time. You will see Jupiter to the left, the hey lower left of the rising moon. In general, the planets this week, you will see Venus to the southwest at dusk. It'll kind of be moving gradually higher and higher over the next few weeks in the sky. Mars is rising about 2 or 3 a.m. local time, still near the blue star Regulus. So both of them will be high in the eastern sky by about dawn. So they have been very close together over the last few weeks. Now they're starting to separate. October the 26th, they'll be about six and a half degrees apart. Remember, five degrees is the width of your three middle fingers held at arm's length. So those are kind of an interesting pair because it's a very, you know, the red, orange, and the blue, different mm. colors. Mm. Comet Ison, if you're able to see it with a telescope, it's still in the near Mars area. Very dim, still only a telescopic object. They have been seeing some evidence that it could be getting better. There's, there's hope there that remains. And Jupiter, at 11 p.m. local time, your time, it will rise in the east to northeast, go high into the southern sky by dawn, hmm. and it's about 8 degrees to the left of it. So that's about 10 degrees is about your fist at arm's length. Uh, you'll see the stars Castor and Pollux of the constellation Gemini. And Pollux is a bright orange star, so that's why I bring it up, is that in that area, orange... Not Mars this time. It is a star from the constellation Gemini. Well, how about that? And uh, like uh, G Garlic in the chat room says, if you uh, get get on a uh, telescope or your binoculars and look up at Jupiter, you just might see Heather and I waving back at you. That's right. That's true. Heather, anything else we want to cover before we roll this week? I don't think so. 
All right. What a, what a good. Well, if you'd like to uh, check out anything Heather talked about, maybe you want to be America's next space star. Well, you can find links and references to all of it in the show notes. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, look for SideBite 106, and scroll down. Specifically, she's got all of the stuff up in the sky laid out for you. Don't forget, you can get a hold of us by clicking that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. Just choose SideBite from the drop down. And of course, there's other plenty of ways you can get a hold of us, like chatting live when we do this show live. Join us at jblive.tv on a Tuesday evening. Hey, Heather, thanks for the great show. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week.